For today's story, we look at a recent U.S. Supreme Court decision, which deals with when sentences are consecutive or concurrent. So if you do multiple bad things, the sentences for those can be consecutive, that is one after the other, or concurrent all at the same time. This makes a pretty huge difference. If you do 20 bad things, and they're all five-year penalties, if you serve them all at the same time, then that's five years. If you serve them all one after the other, that's 100 years. That's a pretty big difference. So how do you determine if it's consecutive or concurrent? What do you do? Well, the federal law sometimes specifies that, and how do we understand what the text of the law means? So we're going to look at one particular instance of this. Let's get started with this. A federal court imposing multiple prison sentences typically has discretion to either run sentences consecutively or concurrently. You've done multiple bad things. Should you serve your sentences all at the same time or one after another? How do we determine that? Now, one of the major factors for determining that is what's called the criminal transaction. All the crimes that occur during a contemporaneous series of criminally related acts. For example, let's suppose you're doing a bank robbery and let's suppose that you stole a car in order to further the bank robbery. That might be viewed as part of the same criminal transaction. The car theft was related to and tied to the bank robbery. They're part of one and the same underlying criminal transaction. So in that kind of situation, that's often a situation in which we run sentences concurrently because they're all part of the same thing. They all should be served at the same time. This isn't a, this isn't a firm rule, but this is a guiding rule. So this is one of the things we look at. So that's one of the things courts look at in trying to determine this. Did you all do the same bad things all at the same time or more to the point related to the same underlying thing or are these different related things? Okay. So court typically has the discretion to choose, but there is an exception in law, which provides in a particular instance that no term of imprisonment imposed on a person under the particular subsection shall run concurrently with any other term of imprisonment. So as to that particular sentence, the judge does not have discretion. That is to be served on top. So they can't run them together. They have to be run separately with respect to that particular charge. So the question here is where that bar on concurrent sentences extends to a sentence that's imposed under a different subsection. So you're being charged with a whole bunch of stuff. Does this language apply in a different context? The petitioner was convicted of the federal crime of aiding and abetting a violation of 924J1 which penalizes a person who, in the course of a violation of subsection C, causes the death of a person through use of a firearm where the killing is a murder. A violation of subsection C occurs when a person uses or carries a firearm during and in relation to any crime of violence or drug trafficking or possession of a firearm in furtherance of such a crime. They are also convicted of a second federal crime, conviction to distribute drugs. Okay, so we've got a person who is doing some drug distribution. Someone is dying by the use of a firearm in connection to this. How do we sentence them accordingly? At sentencing, the district court concluded it lacked discretion to run the sentences concurrently because the relative statutes bar on concurrent sentences governs the sentences. The district court sends them to consecutive terms of imprisonment for the drug distribution count and the underlying firearm count. So we'll run them one after the other. The Court of Appeals affirmed. So the question is, as to this particular sentence, as to this particular charge, do they have to be run one after another, or does the judge get the choice? The judge said here, I have no choice. So was that true? The Supreme Court says the relevant section on bar of concurrent sentences does not govern a section for this particular conviction. The sentence, therefore, can either run consecutively or concurrently. So the language that you read does not apply to this subsection you misunderstood the law district court. The relevant sections criminalize the use, carrying, possession of firearms in connection with certain crimes. Subsection C lays out a list of offenses and their corresponding penalties. It also mandates a term of imprisonment imposed on a person under this subsection must run concurrently with other sentences. Subsection J likewise lays out offense elements and corresponding penalties but unlike subsection C, 
Subsection J contains no consecutive sentence mandate. So Congress said carrying a firearm while committing other crimes is bad. You shouldn't commit crimes while carrying firearms. In one instance, if you're carrying or using a firearm, we're going to say that's a penalty that sits on top. We're going to say it explicitly. In a different section, we didn't say anything at all, which would imply that it should be left up to the judge. They could do consecutive. They could do concurrent, but it's their choice because Congress left it open. Okay. Subsection C, consecutive mandate, applies only to terms of imprisonment within the prescribed subsection. A sentence under subsection J does not qualify. Subsection J is located outside of subsection C, which, you know, you could probably understand that just by reading the terms. Subsection C and subsection J are two different subsections. Wow. And while subsection J does reference subsection C, that reference is limited to offense elements, not penalties. So subsection J does incorporate some of C by reference, but not this part of C. It uses the elements of C, but not the penalties of C. Okay, fine. Congress did not, as the government maintains, incorporate section C as a whole into J, such that J defendants face subsection J penalties plus subsection C penalties. That would be a little bit weird, right? Subsection C carries its penalties with a mandatory on top. Subsection J also covers mandatory penalties without saying. If subsection J fully incorporates subsection J C, that would mean you get subsection J penalties plus, additionally, all of subsection C's penalties, even though you violated only one subsection. This isn't a person who violated both subsection C and subsection J separately, which is certainly possible. This is a person who only violated J. That's the conceit. And so if you say J includes C, then you're getting double whacked, which probably isn't what Congress wanted, because why would they write it that way? Okay. Subsection J nowhere mentions, let alone incorporates, subsection C's penalties. Moreover, as subsection C and J are risen, written, a sentencing court cannot always obey both sets of penalties. To avert potential conflict, the government points to another provision as a model. But assuming without deciding whether that particular section operates, as the government says, with respect to that section, Congress did not implement that particular design in subsection J. So there is a problem in that at least some of the time we can't do both C and J. We can't do both at the same time. They, there are at least some circumstances in which they would conflict. The government says not a problem. If we look to a different subsection completely, the, the, the Congress felt, found a solution to the conflict. So you can just borrow that language to solve the conflict here. It's like, but no, Congress explicitly noted the conflict and explicitly told us how to resolve the conflict. But here, they didn't say anything. So we're not going to interpret them as in conflict. This is a, this is a canon of statutory avoidance, right? We are not going to go out of our way to read one part of a statute in conflict with another part of a statute or one statute in conflict with a completely different statute. We're not going to go out of our way to do that. There are a lot of ways to read a statute or part of a statute as being in conflict with another part of the same statute or a different statute altogether. There are a lot of ways to read two statutes as being in conflict. You know, with a little bit of creativity, you could probably read every statute in conflict with every other statute if you really put your mind to it, right? But we're not going to do that because that would be really, really dumb. We are not going to look purposefully for conflicts, because Congress wrote one thing and wrote another thing and wanted us to do both. We're not going to go out of our way to find conflicts. So yes, there are some situations in which C and J might not conflict, but there are some situations in which it does. And so we can't read J as fully incorporating C, because if it fully incorporated C, then the statutes would at least part of the time be in conflict. And we don't do that. We don't read in conflicts. We look to avoid the conflicts. Sometimes we can't avoid conflicts, but we try. We're not, if there are two plausible readings, one of which does not lead to a conflict, we're doing the other one. Okay. We're doing the one with the not conflicts. That's how we do stuff. Okay. Great. Equally unavailing is the government's argument that under double jeopardy, a defendant cannot receive both subsection C and J sentences for the same conduct. That view of double jeopardy can easily be squared with the conclusion that subsection J neither incorporates subsection C penalties nor triggers consecutive sentence mandates. So 
you know, probably can't get both C and J because that would be a double jeopardy problem. Well, you're the one saying J fully incorporates C, which means they are getting C and J. So if it's true that giving them both C and J is a double jeopardy problem, then your own argument has eaten itself. So we can't do that. It is not implausible, as the government asserts, for Congress to have imposed a harsh consecutive sentence mandate under one subsection, but not another subsection, which covers a more serious offense conduct. That result is consistent with design. Unlike subsection C, subsection J generally eschews mandatory penalties in favoring a sentence plan of flexibility. Of a piece, subsection J permits flexibility to choose between concurrent and consecutive. Congress chose a different approach to punishment in subsection J than in subsection C, and the court must implement the design. So one of the arguments is this doesn't make sense because subsection J is more serious than subsection C. Subsection C isn't as important. So why would Congress say that subsection C adds on top mandatorily when it's not as serious, but in J, where there are more serious conduct, leave it open to discretion? And the Supreme Court's like over here, like, we don't know, but they did. I mean, it's not as serious, therefore add it on because it's only a little bit of extra time, but add it on mandatorily. So it's a small penalty, but we want to make sure that it's recognized versus, you know, you're going to get a lot of extra time. So we don't want those to stack because that would lead to really, really high sentences. Okay, that makes sense. Also, the complete opposite of that would also make sense. Congress ain't made a choice. We're going to stick with the choice. Wow, deep. Justice Jackson delivers an opinion for a unanimous Supreme Court. Thus, that brings us to the end of the discussion about this case, about mandatory sentencing and how we deal with statutes which say there is a mandatory sentence and is to be served consecutively. Sometimes Congress wants to do that. Like, you know, this is a bad thing, and we want to mandate that it be on top of any other thing because we want to make sure that you recognize it's a bad thing. But sometimes Congress doesn't do that, and Congress didn't do that in one particular subsection. They said, hey, as it relates to subsection C, do it on top, one after the other. Do, add them together. Two plus two is four. Do that, okay, as to that. But as to this other one, it's up to you. Do you want to say two plus two is four, or do you want to see two, say two plus two is two? It's up to you. Do you want to run them together or at the same time? Or do you want to run them one after another, consecutively? Which one do you like? Same time, different times. Consecutive, concurrent. Which do you like? And Congress made a choice. So the Supreme Court said, okay, Congress made a choice, and we understand the choice, and it's clear, and that's the end of that analysis. So that brings us to the end of discussion of this case.